Hi, good afternoon, everybody. Um, thank you so much uh, for giving me the opportunity to speak uh, today. And thank you to everyone that's tuning into this webinar. Uh, so my name is Hisham. And as the uh, organizer said, I'm the Global Equities Portfolio Manager at Nomura Asset Management. Uh, for those who are not familiar with Nomura, uh, so we started in Malaysia in 2006, about 14 years ago. And we currently manage about 27 billion ringgit of Malaysian assets. Uh, and this is on behalf of institutions, uh, corporations, and more recently uh, into the retail market uh, through the fund distributions. Um, so, so let me just start by sort of setting the scene. Uh, so we often get asked what and where to invest. Uh, the thing is the market is a forward looking discount mechanism, right? So it incorporates future expectations and this is based on information that is currently available today. Uh, so when we combine this with fiscal and monetary conditions, it creates the investment narrative, uh, i.e. this is the outlook on where and where to invest. So there are a few factors to consider uh, when basing investment decisions based on such outlooks. Uh, so firstly, you know, investors may end up moving from one asset to another as the outlook, which is short term in nature, changes. Uh, more importantly, uh, timing this can be quite complicated. Uh, for starters, a new outlook does not arise simply because we entered into a new year. Rather, it is a response to shifting narratives, which is driven by new information. Uh, so when the narrative shifts, the question is, will we be able to shift in step with the market? So timing macro is not easy. And to a large extent, it's not something that we would really recommend. Uh, rewarding when executed perfectly, but challenging even for you know, like the fast money macro hedge funds. Uh, so with this in mind, I'll go through the outlook first uh, on what and where to invest uh, at the moment. And then I will talk about an alternative approach uh, to long-term investing, uh, one that we believe can navigate the sort of equity cycles better. And most importantly, which we think is perhaps more sustainable. Uh, so this slide uh, just shows you the current macro themes uh, and it answers the question of you know, what and where to invest today. Uh, I'll go through each one in turn and I'll try and keep it at a high level and sort of focus on the sort of main takeaways uh, given the sort of interest uh, uh, of time. So, you know, so the global markets bottomed uh, on the 23rd of March last year in what was one of the fastest declines in the market. So a structural, structural driven recession, such as the great financial crisis, uh, that was driven by the collapse of the housing market and banks. So this recession is a bit different. It was, it was event driven. Uh, so governments had to make tough decisions and lock down the economy. History shows that event driven recessions tend to recover much faster. And what we have seen so far is consistent with history. So whilst the recovery started sooner, we've also had a very sharp recovery comparable to uh, you know, post great financial crisis. Uh, and this is uh, at the point after the market drawdown has ended. Uh, so coming out of the recession, all eyes will be on risk assets, i.e. equities. So the first recommendation really is investing in equities over bonds. How much equities can go up, uh, that will be determined by the pace and the success of the economic recovery. But given that the economic crisis was born out of a health crisis, it is imperative that the health crisis be solved first for the economy to recover. So, you know, like the news of the highly efficacious vaccines is a good start. Now we need to be able to get mass vaccination done to achieve herd immunity. So assuming all of this takes place over the coming months, we should see continued rotation from bonds to equities. As, as a few reasons why bonds should underperform, uh, and this is underperform relative to equities. Firstly, we expect yield curves to steepen with long rent rates rising. So you know, this often happens after recessions. Uh, so if you look at the chart on the lower left, uh, that shows that this is going, uh, you know, so, so let me see if I can get my, okay, I can get my pointer out. It's okay. Um, so uh, yeah, so this actually often happens after recessions. As the sort of, um, you know, uh, sorry, I got, lost my thought, uh, one sec. Uh, yeah, so yeah, after so yield curves often steepens after recessions, and as we're coming out of this recession, we should expect that to be the same. At the same time, we've also got you know a ton of supply of bonds coming up from the U.S. as can be seen uh, from the top right-hand chart. 
So US Treasury issuers will rise, and this is because they need to fund the large fiscal stimulus that they're doing. And this is, again, another headwind for bonds. Uh, additionally, you know, you've got PMIs uh, rising, and this has historically led to equities outperforming bonds, as, as, you, can, as you can see on the bottom right-hand chart. So the culmination of these factors uh, basically points towards this rotation to equities. So the key takeaway here is basically that equities uh, should be preferred over bonds uh, by asset allocators uh, this year. Okay, so within equities, where should we be looking at to invest? So there's a few ways to analyze this. Uh, so let's peel the onion from the top. Uh, firstly, uh, we would go for cyclical sectors over defensive sectors. As we recover from a recession, cyclicals tend to rally as uh, economic growth starts to re-accelerate. So if you look at the chart on the right-hand side, this shows you that PMIs tend to lead the shift in the leadership. The chart on the left shows that the cyclical sectors tend to have earnings which are most correlated to GDP growth. So you know, sectors like basic resources, commodities, miners, they benefit from construction demand coming back. Uh, autos, travel, and leisure, they benefit from discretionary consumer spending returning. Energy, industrials, they benefit from you know, general demand recovery. So these cyclical sectors are where investors should be positioned for going into this year. Um, so now with cyclicality being favored, uh, this usually sets up quite well for the emerging markets. So the preference here would be to have an overweight in emerging markets over the developed markets. So you know, from an equity perspective, uh, emerging markets tend to have higher exposures to the cyclical sectors. So if you look at the chart on the left, it shows that countries like Korea, uh, and India, uh, they have a higher weight in cyclicals and it's likely to benefit from these global flows. So, and also given the sort of emerging market underperformance over the last few years, a rotation into EM is likely. Uh, in fact, you know, it has already begun. Uh, we've seen EM assets and EM FX uh, start to outperform uh, since November of last year. Uh, which brings me to the next slide here on the US dollar. Uh, so again, the US dollar tends to weaken in periods of accelerating global growth. Uh, and this would further fuel that shift into emerging markets. So US investors will look to EM to maximize returns in two ways. First, by taking advantage of this acceleration in earnings of cyclical EM economies. And second, they also get the FX gains from a stronger EM currency versus the weaker dollar. Uh, so you know, for example, just look at where the ringgit is uh, versus the dollar right now. We are close to four. Uh, so Malaysia being part of EM, we should see the sim sort of similar inflow. Uh, as such, uh, ringgit is likely to appreciate against the dollar uh, and something um, for us in ringgit investors to bear in mind, I guess, uh, when we invest in global assets. Uh, obviously, as, as you get the ringgit going up or in this case, the, the US dollar getting weaker, uh, if you're invested in ringgit terms, that will, always, always be, that will obviously be a headwind. Um, but the key here is, I guess, how we manage this FX exposures. Uh, so look towards using uh, FX derivatives uh, to hedge uh, that FX risk. Okay, so the last slide here um, is, again, uh, apart from our preference for, for cyclicals and emerging markets, we'll likely also see you know, small caps and value get more traction from here. So inflection points in the global economy has been key to changing expectations about nearer term growth. And therefore relative valuation starts to matter a bit more. Uh, the left hand chart shows you that the equal weighted S&P uh, com when compared to the market cap weighted S&P, uh, what we can see is that, you know, like after trust in the recession, breadth uh, tends to improve. Uh, this means two things really. Small cap stocks tend to outperform the large cap stocks. So the Russell outperforms the S&P and lower valuation companies uh, or what we often re refer to as value stocks, uh, they tend to benefit from this uh, as investors start to focus on the sort of relative valuation. Okay, so I guess when we put all of this together, uh, the setup for this year, um, as I mentioned earlier, it sort of favors equities over bonds. Uh, but within equities, it's cyclical sectors, it's emerging markets, it's small caps, it's value, and a weaker dollar should be the theme. Uh, but to put things into perspective, um, if we just take a step back here, the outlook for risk assets from here sets up really well. Uh, think, if you think about the policy rates pretty much at the zero bound, 
uh, we have strong forward guidance from central banks. So we expect no change to policy rates until 2024 or maybe back half of 23 in the US, uh, not till 2025 in Europe. And, and this is all supportive for higher equity valuations. Uh, and when you add negative real interest rates, uh, a record loose US financial conditions, a loosening fiscal policy, we have you know, a set of conditions that is extremely supportive uh, for risk assets. And perhaps the larger risk here in my mind is just not being invested. Uh, of course, the largest risk that remains is whether or not we can overcome the sort of health crisis, as I mentioned earlier. Um, but, uh, but this is where we are right now. Um, okay, so, so the what and where to invest that I covered sort of in the previous slides, um, as mentioned in my intro, you know, they're, they're short term narratives and they can change at an instant. At some point this year, I think the move higher in yields is likely to trigger another rotation and we could see assets flowing back to the developed markets and, and we'll probably see some of the reversals of the sort of current preferences that we, that I sort of laid out earlier. Um, but the second thing I wanted to do today uh, is to sort of offer investors an alternative view on how you can structure your overall sort of investment uh, portfolio uh, to perhaps combine the sort of long-term uh, look uh, versus the sort of the short-term. So in, in, in our view, you know, the long-term investing requires a degree of consistency in the portfolios. Uh, so this chart uh, just shows you the earnings of global companies, uh, including and excluding tech and secular growth. Uh, so sectors like tech, digital media, e-commerce, this is all lumped into the sort of secular growth uh, area. So the gray line uh, shows you the sort of um, earnings of all global companies. And the global earnings are still at a level that is below at uh, the peak before the great financial crisis. The light blue line shows that earnings are even lower when you exclude sectors like the secular growth sectors. And the dark blue line shows you how much this sort of um, secular growth sectors have grown in the past. And the reality is it will continue to grow into the foreseeable future as this is what's shaping our lives right now. So effectively we have two paths uh, to investing here. So the first one you know, it, it is focused more on the sort of short term narratives. And the second one sort of focuses on longer term structural or secular trends. Uh, so with what I've learned uh, during my time in the UK and sort of putting uh, a, a sort of very long term hat on, uh, we created this sort of secular growth framework, uh, which basically emphasizes companies and industries that sort of stand to benefit from stable structural trends. And this should enable these companies to grow over the long term as they are less dependent on overall economic growth. Uh, we visualize this framework via the future investment themes uh, that you see on the slide, and it broadly categorizes the sort of secular trends into five uh, distinct areas. Uh, so no doubt, uh, you know, the world is rapidly changing and tech innovation is growing at an exponential rate. So as such, you, know, you think, think about trends like cloud computing, AI, 5G, this is shaping our future. And these trends pretty much form the sort of hardware uh, tech future themes. Uh, then we have the move towards digitalization, which has enabled you know, internet based companies to take market share from traditional channels. Think about shift of uh, marketing ad dollars from TV and print, you know, newspaper, radio, that kind of stuff uh, to online search uh, and to you know, online advertising on social media platforms or e-commerce, uh, you know, the shift from brick and mortar shopping to sort of online shopping or even cash to digital payments. And, and even you know, with the millennials today, it's physical sports uh, getting, trend, uh, getting moving, moving on to e-sports, right? So these are all trends that is likely to continue into the distant future. And this is a source of growth and wealth creation. Um, so the last, one, uh, last two years, like large cap pharma, obviously has played a very large role in improving the quality of our lives over the last decades. Um, but whilst their growth is starting to slow, the growth in sort of medical tech and biotech is still accelerating. So you have robot assisted surgeries, we have new tech sort of replacing traditional procedures, we've got analytics, we've got diagnostics. You know, these form the future uh, theme uh, called healthcare. And lastly, we have the uh, software future theme. And you know, as more and more of our lives are transitioning online, the importance um, of enterprise software will continue to rise 
whether it's cybersecurity uh, or uh, improving organi organizational efficiencies or uh, changing how companies can interact with their customers, the list goes on. Uh, simply put, you know, the future investment themes are long duration. Uh, this is to say you know, the investment horizon is very long dated and they have significant room for growth. So as a Malaysian investor, uh, it, it makes sense uh, for us to allocate a portion of our portfolio to these themes, especially if it's gonna provide this sort of level of consistency uh, in our portfolios uh, over the sort of longer term period. Um, so, actually, so if you want, you can visit uh, bit.ly slash Nomura FB. Uh, this is basically uh, some of the infographics that we've done on the future investment themes. Uh, is you, you can, or you can just go on Facebook. Uh, is is in uh, is on our Facebook page uh, under one of the albums. Uh, but this should give you a, a quick idea in terms of like why we like uh, these future investment themes. Um, so you know, with this alternative approach to long-term investing in mind, uh, we created the Strategic Growth Fund, or uh, SGF uh, for short, uh, which is the one that I manage. Uh, and our objective is uh, really to create uh, this sort of core holding for the investors' portfolios. And the future investment themes uh, sort of sit at the center uh, of SGF. The investment philosophy for SGF uh, is supported by two pillars. So the first pillar is uh, we've got this equity strategy that focuses on the future investment theme, but it is also complemented by uh, what I call a tactical book. So, you know, as a fund manager, you know, I, I can't simply just ignore the macro themes uh, that I sort of laid out earlier. So as such, to capitalize on these sort of short-term narratives, uh, we take uh, tactical positions to optimize the portfolio. So as per the slide here, um, you know, the equity strategy combines the sort of long-term and the short-term, uh, the long-term via the future investment themes, and this makes up a bigger portion of the overall portfolio, something like 80% of it right now. And, and the short term uh, is addressed by, uh, you know, the sort of tactical book, which is basically following the sort of what and where to invest. Um, and the second pillar of the investment philosophy is a multi-asset strategy. Uh, so we wanted to offer this simplicity uh, to our investors. So as discussed earlier, uh, the market narrative can change at, uh, instantly and, and they don't change at fixed points in time. As such, you know, to help investors navigate the sort of what and where to invest, we made SGF as a multi-asset fund uh, so that we can help uh, you to allocate uh, or to help allocate on your behalf and, and make decisions such as you know, putting more or less into equities uh, against bonds or to be able to allocate into different parts of the world. Uh, so you know, we invest uh, in the US, Europe, UK, China, and Australia. And, and, and the allocations obviously can change depending on the narratives. Uh, we also add to gold uh, when it is required, and uh, we use FX derivatives um, against a hedge uh, against ringgit appreciating against other currencies, uh, but only when we think that uh, it is time to hedge out that risk. So it's not always hedged, it's hedged when we think uh, ringgit is, is on the way up. Um, so with this sort of flexible design, we can shift the allocations between you know, equities and bonds, between regions, sectors, style, uh, and, and of course, the magnitude of the shifts uh, will be much lower uh, compared to a, say, a pure macro fund. Uh, after all, the future investment themes, uh, they form the core of the portfolio and, and it is designed uh, to be long duration. Uh, but that said, you know, we hope that the sort of combination of the multi-asset strategy and the tactical book uh, will lead to sort of better risk-adjusted returns. And, and what we hope uh, to be you know, a core holding uh, for, for the investors. Uh, i.e., you know, it sort of stays on the sort of top shelf and uh, perhaps investors don't have to do much uh, until the time comes uh, to sort of harvest uh, those returns uh, um, at the re retirement. Uh, so, so here are some charts uh, that I've included to sort of slice and dice the fund in a few ways, uh, just to give you, I guess, some feel in terms of how the fund is structured. Uh, so the first chart here shows how the equity book, uh, which is 65% of the fund right now, that is to say, you know, the multi-asset strategy means that we've got 65% in equities, uh, we've got about 30% in sort of fixed income, and, and, and the remainder sort of in gold, uh, although I think gold is about 2.5% and there's some in, in, in the money markets. Uh, and, 
the first chart here shows you the split uh, from the, for the equity book into various sectors. Uh, so information tech and communication services, uh, this is basically where digital media sits, uh, makes up about 50% um, of the book. Uh, the second chart breaks this down via our future investment teams. Uh, and you can see here that the tactical book, uh, you know, which is the sort of trying to address the short term narratives, uh, is slightly larger than usual uh, at 23%. Um, but uh, it sort of gives you an idea in terms of how we split uh, the book into the different investment teams. Um, and, and the third chart here shows you the equity book uh, by region or by country. Uh, it's just worth noting here that the US makes up about 60% of global equity markets. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, even for SGF, we do have uh, exposure right now of close to uh, just above 60%. Uh, China makes up about 13%. Uh, Europe and Japan makes up the remaining 20%. Uh, so as a Malaysian investor, uh, you know, I personally feel uh, that this allocation, especially for a sort of long term sort of core holding is a good one. Uh, and what investors can do is uh, you can add investments to complement uh, this sort of core holding. Uh, to, uh, and this is so that you can achieve your own sort of uh, return objectives or to match uh, your own risk tolerances a, a bit better. Mm -hmm. So obviously being a multi asset fund, uh, the risk category is lower than a pure equity fund. As such, the expected returns should also be, in theory, uh, lower. Uh, but for those looking to increase the risk reward of their overall portfolios, you can add in some pure equity funds to tilt the allocations uh, to your preference. Uh, so, so just to wrap up, SGF was launched on the 2nd of June uh, since inception uh, to the end of last year, so about seven months. It returned about 12.67% for Class A, 12.59% for Class B. Uh, as of last Thursday, it was up 15.84% for Class A and 15.6% for Class B. Um, and uh, just, just quickly to touch on, apart from the two pillars, we also have um, these other two pillars where we aim to make SGF affordable and transparent. Uh, so in that way, SGF has a 0% sales charge. And each month, I write investment letters uh, to discuss how the fund has performed, dissect the market narratives, and lay out the strategy sort of going forward. Uh, so those of you interested to learn more about SGF, uh, do sign up uh, to our webinar next week. Uh, the link is there on the slides, bit.ly slash Nomura webinar. Uh, you can also uh, speak to our, um, uh, to our marketing team at, at the investment booths. Uh, and um, yeah, I mean, I, I will try and provide as much insights into the fund and also do, uh, like we will do it in two halves. We'll talk about the fund and we'll talk about uh, in investing 101. So bringing it back to the basics. I'll give my views on how I approach investing and why we need to invest in our risk assets and, and, and stuff like that. Uh, so with that, I know that I'm short in time. Uh, so thank you so much uh, to everyone for listening to my presentation. And perhaps we can take a question or two if time permits.